Good morning, everyone. My name is Patrick Bernoulli, Executive Director of Job Service North Dakota. I'm excited to be your host today. Sorry for the delayed start. We had some technical difficulties that we're working through, but I want to thank you all for joining us for our webinar, The Labor Market Information Playbook, How to Get in the Game by Exploring Fundamentals and Strategies. Before we get started, we have a few housekeeping items to cover. We have muted the chat and microphones during this webinar to provide you with the best experience. If time allows, upon conclusion of our presentations, we will open the chat for your questions, comments, and feedback. It's very important for us to get every question, comment, and feedback that you have. So we will also be providing an email address at the end where you can submit your question, comments, and feedback in that format. Over the course of the next week or so, we will summarize all Q&A and we will distribute that information to all participants attending today's session. Although we are recording our webinar today, SHRM recertification credits will only be available to those attending our live webinar. North Dakota SHRM will be sharing that code soon for those of you seeking credit. This is our third webinar this year, and we're really excited to be here with you today. As the state, state's designated workforce agency, we bring employers and job seekers together. We are always seeking innovative ideas to bring to our employers, and these webinars are just one of those tools to help you. Our past webinars have focused on work-based learning and the hiring of international students. If you mi missed either of those webinars, you can view them on our mainjobsnd.com website under the employer resource section. As some of you probably know, I travel throughout the state presenting to different audiences and I make it a point to share labor market information relative to the area and or industry I'm presenting in. It's incredibly important to me to create awareness throughout our state. I share information about their county or industry, open jobs, education, population, and wages. I study area profile reports so I understand the communities better. Then I use that information to provoke thought about strategies to help solve the workforce challenges through making informed decisions and setting policy. I also serve on the Workforce Development Council and our second quarter meeting this year was held at Microsoft in Fargo. Our labor market information manager, Marsha Havens, presented a plethora of labor uh, market information to the council. As she shared this valuable information, I was observing the room and I noticed how they were all hanging on every word. It was then that I knew we needed to be sharing this information to a broader audience to create statewide awareness, which brings us to today. Today is all about the data, and those of you who work with data, you already know how powerful that data can be when making decisions and setting policy. For those of you who work with it less but want to learn more, I have three words for you. Data is power. To show you just how powerful that data is, we've asked our community leaders to step forward and share how they use that data. These subject matter experts will dive into details, share how they use the data, and provide some key points of how you too can become a subject matter expert and use the data to your advantage. Our first speaker today is Marcia Havens. Marcia has been employed with Job Service North Dakota in the Labor Market Information Center, otherwise known as LMI, for over 20 years and has worked in state government for over 25 years. Prior to job service, she was the International Marketing Director for the North Dakota State Tourism Division. She is currently the manager of the LMI Center, which is charged with developing data, products, and services based on North Dakota's labor market. She also serves on several national workforce committees related to labor market information. Marcia has a strong interest in the economy and the desire to see our employers and workforce succeed. Welcome, Marcia. I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Pat, and thank you all for joining us today. We're looking forward to sharing ways you can use labor market information to assist you with decision making, policy planning, and more. I'll be touching on an overview of the data and publications we have available, our services and structure, as well as some commonly asked questions. What is LMI? Uh, it's an acronym for labor market information, and we'll be referring to that throughout this webinar. In the simplest terms, it's really any information that relates to the labor market where workers and employers meet. So if you think about when you see signs for businesses hiring, uh, new business opening, closures, or even road construction, those are all indicators of the labor market. And who uses LMI? Users of labor market information include, but are not limited to job seekers, educators, career counselors, students, employers, economic developers, HR, and other workforce professionals. So really a long list. 
Um, we'll take a little bit more of a deeper dive into what is labor market information. And it consists of data, statistics, and analysis related to employment and the workforce. And that can include topics such as labor supply and demand, uh, wages and income, labor force and unemployment statistics, employment projections, and even labor force demographics. LMI can help users make informed decisions by answering common questions like, what is the average wage for certain occupations? What types of benefits do companies, companies like mine offer their employees? How many North Dakotans are unemployed? How many are employed? And something important to note is that the majority of the data we produce uses the same methodology as all other states. We all operate under the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the Employment and Training Administration. So it's really a solid way to conduct state to state and also nationwide comparisons. Our team, uh, the Labor Market Information Center, it operates with two distinct and yet fully integrated activities and funding sources. Each of our two units operates under its own federal funding stream and each has its own cooperative agreement and core deliverables in order to maintain those funding streams and grants. And the same holds true for other states having to follow these deliverables and federal guidelines as well. A couple of examples of this guidance would be using the same methodology from state to state, as well as maintaining employer confidentiality and not releasing identifiable information. Our Bureau of Labor Statistics Programs Unit is responsible for collecting and analyzing essential economic information to support that uh, public and private decision-making. And then the Employment and Training Administration side of things per takes that data and provides training, employment data, and labor market information. And that unit is required to develop and disseminate essential state and local workforce information for a wide range of customer groups. Now, in addition to this, we also conduct our own surveys on a variety of subjects with economic significance to North Dakota, and we publish those results as well. As far as our services go, we provide education and data to our users and assist with topics such as how businesses can tap into labor market information and assist with employee recruitment. Uh, we look at reducing turnover and keeping workers, such as how does my turnover compare to my industry on average? Um, and then we also look at occupational wage data. We can use ONET to create interest and work importance profilers that can help determine if potential employees are a good fit. Uh, we work with employers on setting compensation levels. Uh, businesses or economic developers on relocating to or expanding in a new area. And then there's general labor economic awareness, such as what are the trends overall. So again, it's required that we follow federal guidelines. And so with everything we do, there is the standardized terminology and methodology involved. And the compilation of our data is governed by state and federal regulations. So all these things are really distinguishing features about the data obtained through the LMI Center here at Job Service North Dakota. All of our products are available online on our website, which is ndlmi.com, and we do conduct training sessions for a wide variety of audiences. Now, beyond our partnership with the Bureau of Labor Statistics, we also have secondary data sources such as the U.S. Census Bureau and the Bureau of Economic Analysis, which are used to supplement our cooperative program data. We are well versed in those programs as well and include data in our that particular data in our products and use it to fulfill requests that we receive. 
the variety of data we use is compiled to create products that are beneficial to all users. Um, these topics include anything from industry and occupational projections to benefits to wages by occupation. Uh, labor market information can be used really in a wide variety of situations from career starts and changes to business startups to economic events in local areas. Now, if you've been to our website, ndlmi.com, you'll recognize these graphics. You'll find a variety of formats within each of these graphics or topics. We provide a publication in PDF format. Uh, most have a downloadable da data set and some have dashboards associated with them. We're always looking for ways to expand, create, and make this information user friendly. And as far as ways our users can use this data, um, groups like job seekers, education, educators, and students can assess job skills, set goals, and research training providers. They can forecast curriculum, uh, research possible career choices, and research regional labor market information such as wages. And if we look at employers, economic developers, HR, and other, other workforce professionals, they can research labor market information on wages and economic data, um, assess current trends that are in North Dakota's job market, review the economic climate for any industry, and analyze labor market in areas of North Dakota where they may want to locate a business. I'm going to spend a little time on making informed decisions in education and employment using LMI on the next few slides. You'll see a few graphics of the products to also hopefully help provoke some thought. Um, this should provide you with just a few ideas on how LMI can help you. Our online job openings report can answer questions such as what occupations are growing or declining. That's on the top half of your screen. And this data can give employers and policymakers a current summary of labor demand by occupation, by industry, and also by geographic area. It also provides a type of education typically required for openings along with wages, and then there is more data beyond that yet. And the occupational demand rankings, which is at the bottom half of your screen, uh, that they reveal the greatest opportunities in specific occupations and are determined by a demand score. Those rankings are updated four times a year to coincide with releases of newer input data. The education profile summarizes broad trends in K-12 and post-secondary education including enrollment counts, graduates and graduation rates, and also post-secondary program completions by field of degree. And also included uh, our data on the median annual earnings and employment status of North Dakota's population ages 25 and higher by educational attainment and field of degree. And then the careers in North Dakota publication on the right side of the screen there is the graphic that can assist with questions related to specific occupations and what core tasks skills and typical education requirements are for specific occupations and then additionally we've tagged those occupations that are high demand high wage and belong to one of five skill clusters our long-term employment projections data, that's on the top half of your screen, that can help with career planning and assessing future staffing and training needs given the employment projections and other trends. Um, in addition to long-term employment projections, which is a 10-year forecast, we also have two-year um, short-term projections. And that is one piece that is often used to help forecast curriculum. 
We also have an education piece to our long-term projections, which projects education and training needs. Now the benefits guide on the bottom half can help employers and job seekers determine competitive benefits um, given a company size, industry, or even geographic region. So on the business side, it can answer questions such as how do benefits compare by industry and areas within the state? And benefits really have become increasingly important, um, a component of an employee's total compensation package. And employers are using benefits as a tool to improve retention and recruitment and to determine competitiveness across industries. Now for this slide, I included screenshots of a couple of our dashboards rather than what is in the publication. We have several dashboards and are in the process of creating more based on our data sets. Um, they're really a great tool to use to get a snapshot of, cert of a certain data set and are very user friendly. Our employment and wages by occupation can help employers and job seekers determine those competitive wages for certain skill or certain occupations, either in their area or more generally in North Dakota. It can also be used to analyze wage rates across markets and states, develop staffing patterns and occupational projections, and also plan for careers. And then our North Dakota cost of living dashboard is a great tool to use for retention and in answering the question, are wages I'm providing keeping up with the cost of living in my area? So users can compare living costs for 24 household types and then geographic areas down to the county level. There are seven fundamental living expense categories that are tracked within this and represent a basic needs cost of living. So this overview should have you thinking, what do I want to know and how can labor market information help me? Our next presenters are going to talk about how they've been able to use labor market information in their business uses. So we're looking forward to hearing that and thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Marcia. For our audience today, as you just learned, LMI encompasses many variables and there are changes happening within the economy daily. There are data sets, dashboards, and publications to assist with decision making in many settings, including economic development, career counseling, HR, job seeking, and so much more. Marcia and her team are here to support you. They can absolutely help you get to where you want to go. Our next speaker is Becca Kruger. Becca serves as the Director of Workforce Development for the Grand Forks Region Economic Development Corporation, where she evaluates labor markets, imagining and implementing workforce programs that help talented people and innovative businesses find their homes in Grand Forks, North Dakota. She directs the international award-winning Greater Grand Forks Way Cooler Than You Think Talent Attraction Initiative. She manages the Northern Valley Career Expo. She leads Intern Grand Forks Funding Program and co-chaired the team that raised $22 million to launch the Career Impact Academy CTE Center. Becca currently serves as the International Economic Development Association's Young Professionals Advisory Board and was appointed by Governor Burgum to serve on his Workforce Development Council, where she leads the council's Recruit and Retain Subcommittee. In 2020, she was named North Dakota's Nonprofit Emerging Leader by the North Dakota Association of Nonprofit Organizations. In 2021, she was named one of Prairie Business Magazine's 40 Under 40, and in 2023, she was named one of the top 40 economic developers under 40 by Development Counselors International. Welcome, Becca. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Pat. I'm so excited to be here today to talk about my favorite subject, workforce, and also because it's day five of a COVID quarantine. So this also serves as an apology for my raspy voice. Uh, today, I'm going to talk from the lens of economic developer, and I'm going to spend some time talking about what an economic development agency does and also about what a workforce developer does, which is what my role is. So if you're not familiar with the world of economic development, your community probably has one. Um, your agency usually will either exist within your city 
or within um, a non nonprofit that's privately structured. And that's how we exist here in the Grand Forks region. We also work a lot with partners who impact the world of economic development, um, chambers of commerce, or uh, people like Matt Marshall, who you'll hear from today, who work with uh, utility and power companies and do economic development in their roles. <clears throat> So um, we focus specifically at our economic development agency on primary sector, and that means people who make goods in the region and sell them somewhere else. So think about a Philadelphia macaroni that makes a box of pasta and then they ship it all around the world. It could also be a small business, like a Half Brothers Brewing Company that has a canning line and they sell their beer and soda across four different states. So that's what primary sector means. It's different than retail and hospitality. It's bringing new wealth to the community by selling product outside of the community. <clears throat> So my role within economic development is that of a workforce developer. And what, what I do is I truly examine and am present in community conversation to understand the needs of industry. Um, I'm constantly evaluating what systems are working, where are there gaps? What are your region's industry aspirations? I'm interfacing with industry every single day to make sure that we're listening and evaluating. And then we work to build and implement. So through partnerships, because none of this work that we do is done alone, we try to envision and solve challenges. And specifically, I'm doing that through a workforce system lens. What are the problems within workforce systems and how do we work to solve them? And one thing that I specifically want to talk about on this webinar is how in your role as an economic developer, uh, you can use labor market information to help with site selection. And site selection is when a company or a business is evaluating, where do I want to set up my next plant or, or operation? And um, so they're doing three primary steps when you talk about site selection. Uh, and the first step is the identification phase, and that's what sites and communities are in the running. And during this phase, you're probably up against anywhere from 40 to 100 different communities. And the company is going to issue an RFP either to your state or directly to your community. And then it's your response as an economic development agency or a community to provide um, a response to that site selector and that company. So then the company will take the information that you've provided and they'll go through phase two. That's an evaluation phase. Basically, your goal during this phase is to not get kicked out because you want to be um, chosen as the place where this business chooses to grow and expand. So during that phase, they're going to look at, do you have all the things that they need and is your community being responsive? Have you provided uh, the information, do they feel like they're going to be able to be able to work with your community throughout a process of standing up a new business, which can be very complex. And then the third phase is the choosing. And this is where the real work begins. They've got all the information. They've made a choice. And now you got to stick some shovels in the ground and work with your cities and your municipalities, your infrastructure providers, your utilities to really stand up that business. So I'm going to talk specifically about the first and second phase of how you can use labor market info information during um, that site selection process. So in the evaluation phase, what they're looking for is really, do you have the land and buildings and infrastructure they need? Because they're not going to be able to establish something if that first piece of the stool isn't in place. And then they're also looking at your business support programs. Do you have friendly policies for their ind industry? 
uh, is your state and your regional leaders welcoming to their industry? And then also what we're going to focus on today, do you have the right supply and cost of labor to operate profitably? Now, back 20 years ago, the first two legs of this stool, I would say, were the most important. But in today's day and age, increasingly, labor markets and labor supply are the things that site selectors are looking at as they're making their choice for communities. So I talked about how we work in partnerships, and this is a great A partnership. Who you really need to meet, this is Mary Hodak. She is the business advisor for Region 4. And um, through my work as an economic developer, I probably talk to Mary more often than she would like. She is a fantastic resource. Um, and your business advisors in your region, I encourage you to reach out and make amazing partnerships with them, whether you're an economic developer, whether you're a human resource manager. There is not one question that I've asked Mary that she hasn't been able to answer and not one question that she has not um, responded timely and with a smile, even though it's digitally. I know she's smiling at me. <clears throat> So um, next slide, please. So when a site selector is evaluating whether or not um, they want to enter our markets and specifically our labor markets, when I'm responding to workforce, uh, I always go to Mary and I will give her a list of the job titles um, that that employer intends to stand up as they uh, establish their site here. So using those job titles, you can pull a wage analysis report specifically by the job title, and you can pull it specifically for your MSA or for your region. So we're region for Grand Forks, Walsh, Nelson, and Pembina County. And you can provide that to the site selector. Um, this is really going above and beyond uh, because most of the time the site selector has to do that work on their own. So this is really establishing a level of customer service. The great thing about these wage analysis reports by job title is those employers can look at averages and they can look all the way from the 10th percentile up to the 150th percentile of what does your region pay or need to pay in order to be competitive. So we've had some employers who want to come in on the lower end and, and uh, provide that level of cost savings for their company. And then we want to have employers who want to establish and pay uh, on the top end over the 100th percentile so that they can become an employer of choice. So these reports have been really beneficial. This one on the screen is specifically for registered nurses. You can also look at um, pulling other regions in, whether it's regions across North Dakota, or I've even worked with Mary to pull uh, peer cities like a St. Cloud or a Sioux Falls so that there can be some benchmarking that happens. And you can choose whether or not you wanna provide that information to the site selector or use it for internal uses, because sometimes it shows your community is really favorable and you're going to be able to pay lower wages and save that company money. And sometimes it shows that, oh, well, you're actually above that um, average of peer cities. So, um, Another report that I like to pull is this benefits analysis report. So Marsha touched on this a little bit. And you can see that you can pull it specifically by industry. So this one is educational services on the right hand side. And you can see what percentage of um, companies are offer offering different types of benefits. So you can see that 74% of people are providing paid leave in educational services. Um, but then when you look at housing relocation assistance, almost no, no companies are doing that. So you can really benchmark your benefits. And this is a really great thing when you're thinking whether you're um, a new company who's establishing 
or I also work quite closely with um, current companies who uh, we want to retain in the region, I always recommend that they should be doing an annual wage and benefits analysis to make sure they're staying competitive in the marketplace. Um, another thing that you can look at is uh, the labor force participation in unemployment by industry. So if a company wants to say, are you going to have enough people or labor supply in order to be able to successfully operate my new business, this is a great report to uh, look at as well, because it will show the number of people working in here. You can benchmark uh, that against current employment trends. And you can also see the numeric change. Are you growing in that industry? Are you growing employees in that industry? That's a great story to share with site selectors as they're um, considering. Another thing that I always like to provide during this process is our labor force uh, participation rate. We have one of the highest labor force participation rates in the entire US. In fact, I think we might be number one. Um, and so this is always something that I like to share as well. We're hardworking in the Midwest and people want to go to work. Next slide, please. So this is a side note uh, for current HR managers and executives. <clears throat> please make sure, like I said, that you are considering uh, your benefits guide. These are all things that can help not only new businesses who are looking at the area, but current businesses and HR managers. Sometimes paying for those tools like a study on labor market analysis or um, things like job a a EQ or other tools are very, very expensive. Um, and so you can use the free tools of North Dakota LMI to get some baseline information. So I would ask you, who is your Mary? That is really what I would say is, how are you building those connections? And one thing for me is if you have any question at all on how do you go through the online database or maybe you just want someone to pull the report so that you can alleviate some of your work time. I'm looking at you HR managers. I know how busy you guys are. Um, your Mary is able to truly help and to be able to pull some of those things for you. So that will get you to your community's ultimate goal, which is site selection and the choosing, and that's where the real work begins. So by being responsive, by providing information that helps site selectors make informed decisions, you're really able to have a competitive advantage during this process by using North Dakota's labor market information. Thank you so much for having me today, and I'm going to turn it back over to Pat. Thank you, Becca. You shared some great information, and it's easy to see how economic developers can use LMI data for workforce development projects, whether for business recruitment or retention projects. Becca, you also serve as a great example of how organizations can leverage our amazing team at Job Service North Dakota. Well done, and thank you. Next, we have Matt Marshall. Matt is the Member Services Rates and Economic Development Manager from Midcota Power, providing economic development services for 11 member cooperatives and 12 municipal systems throughout Minnesota and North Dakota, spanning over 35,000 square miles. Through this work, Matt supports member managers and Northern Municipal Power Agency communities with efforts focused on business retention, expansion, business attraction, and community development. In addition to his work for Minn Kota Power, Matt serves on the board of directors for Dakota Business Landing. He is the current president of the Mid-America Economic Development Council and serves as a vice chairperson on the Governor's North Dakota Workforce Development Council. Prior to his time with Mid-Kota, Matt worked as the economic developer for Otter Tail Power, the city of West Fargo, and as the director of sales for the economic development consulting firm, Golden Shovel Agency. Matt resides in Grand Forks, North Dakota with his wife and two young children. Welcome, Matt and I'll turn it over to you. Hey, thanks, Pat. I really appreciate it. Um, and Becca did a fantastic job laying out what an, an economic development organization does. Um, and functionally, sort of the gold standard traditionally in the past was we want to do site selection. That absolutely is what we want to do and build the economy. But I want to back up and say, 
why does it matter to you if you're an HR or you're a legislator, legislator, or you're just a citizen that happens to find their way onto this webinar? Why would you care? And then how do organizations start that process? How do they identify what are their goals and objectives? And how do you use the LMI data to inform that and steer it to ensure that you have productive results? So again, we're going to understand what L or North Dakota LD, LMI data um, is used for while you're developing economic development community objectives. We're going to learn how to engage our local businesses to understand that and fact check it to make sure that you're moving in the same direction. And we're going to learn to identify opportunities and threats using this data and then understand how uh, this data can then evaluate the success or failures or how you need to adjust as you move forward. <clears throat> as Pat mentioned, we're a, a small but mighty team here in uh, Minn Kota Power. And so we're a generation and transmission utility. What that means is we make the power and then we transmit it um, across large distances. And then that power is taken by our uh, member cooperatives. So if you're in North Dakota, you think about uh, Nodak Electric around Grand Forks or Cass County Electric around the Fargo area. They deliver that to your home or business. We also serve a bunch of cities like the city of Grafton or Park River would be good examples, and they actually take that power and deliver it to their business. Within our economic development team, um, it's led by Melissa Beach, uh, who was the economic developer at Castleton most recently, um, and then myself and Lisa Severson also support those efforts. Um, and what we do is we focus on the comprehensive approach to solving issues that are preventing natural and healthy growth and prosperity. And what that means is we're going to take a look at whatever area we're working in and we're going to help our communities and our counties identify what are those things that are preventing that growth and prosperity. And, and that takes on many different forms. So next slide. As I mentioned, we're going to talk about why do you care? What does this mean to you? And and most of the time when we go into communities, we really talk a lot about, you know, revenue, quality of life, um, and what does all that encompass? So if you're an HR director or an HR representative, you might be thinking, well, why do I care about the economic development efforts that Becca had mentioned? Well, it's about workforce recruitment. It's about training. It's about attracting those employees to your employer or your place of business and making that effort easier for you and more cost effective, frankly. Um, if you're a legislator and you have found your way on this, this webinar, uh, it's how to increase a tax base, build community resiliency through diversity, um, and in you know, and talk about how to truly diversify an economy so that you make sure that you have, um, you know, a, a, a broad base of business and opportunities for those residents. And if you're a business owner and you happen to be on here, you know, it's about increasing your customer base, uh, increasing suppliers, increasing services. So we really take a holistic approach and make sure that these efforts are of value to every constituent, no matter where we're working. So how do we do that? So what I've done is we've picked through uh, the LMI data and decided what we use probably most often. And, you know, this is a really robust tool. You can use it for a lot of different things, but generally speaking, high level, when you want to go in and develop a, a good strategic plan, you're going to focus on the economic data library. That's a great starting place. And so within that data library, you have that button right there. You can look at the American Community Survey. And what that does is that helps you track your demographic trends. Um, they get that right out of the census. They aggregate it for you, so it's super easy to understand. You can look at building permits. That gives you a good representation of are we growing, are we shrinking, have we not had, you know, whether it's housing or commercial building permits in a long time, what does this mean for local investment purposes? You can look at commuting patterns. If you're a business out there and you're wondering like, hey, I'm struggling to get uh, employees in the door, perhaps you can look at where communities are our employees are commuting from and say, you know what, I can market in a broader area than I was thinking. Or perhaps you can see that they're not 
and what do we need to do to get additional population in those other areas that would commute into a particular business? Who are our largest employers, local employers? So, you know, that can help guide your strategy. Local employers can, can really localize, you know, what services are available, where are people working? Location quotients, which I'll cover later, um, they're my favorite. And, and they're really insightful in guiding, you know, your, your effort. The cost of living, um, we touched on that a little bit, and we'll talk about how we use that. And then population, and we'll talk about how that relates to expenses and how that impacts literally every citizen. Next slide. So what we want to do is we want to give you some examples here. And so what we want to do is understand how do we use this? So let's take population as an example. And I picked on graft in North Dakota just because it's in our territory and and it's a great example of what can happen and how that relates to everybody. So graft in North Dakota, as you can see, is seeing a population decline really going back 30 to 40, 50 years. Um, and and. Again, you may be thinking, well, OK, so the population's declined in this particular area. And if I live there, what does that mean for me? Well, our school state funding formulas are tied to per student population. So if you have a, a school, you're already going to pay for the maintenance of that school or to have it there. Whether you have a class, a fifth grade class full of eight kids or 17 kids, you still have to pay that teacher. So what happens is if you have a class room and that population in that class declines, you still have all of your fixed costs. Yet the infrastructure in that area is built for a carrying capacity that's much higher. Where do this, does that deficit get picked up? Not from the state government because they're going to follow the student, but locally in the form of property taxes. Uh, the same is true for state infrastructure spending. You've got communities out there that are built for a carrying capacity that are much higher. And so if a road goes bad or something, you have fewer people to divide those funds on. And a lot of our state funding programs like the Prairie Dog Fund are population based. And so if you're a business or an employer and you're struggling to get people, that is a direct correlation to cost of limit living and cost of doing business in a particular area. So we like to keep our eye on population for sure. Next slide. Another example of how to engage, uh, you know, this effort and how to build out what your needs are to then develop that into a strategy is understanding, you know, who are your largest local employers. So LMI has a great button. Again, we've labeled it here. You just click that button, you go in and you say, okay, who are our largest employers here? Who do we need to be talking to and what are their issues that they're facing? So you want to go in and understand the needs, understand the, the impacts of what a significant event can have. So what does that mean to you as, a, as an HR director or a legislator or another economic development or just a general citizen? If you're in a community and you have one of these largest employers that either can't expand because they don't have the workforce or uh, worst case scenario, they close. What does that mean for the rest of the community? You can fact check that with location quotients as well, and we'll we'll talk about that. Next slide. So here's an example. Uh, I picked on Jamestown because they're a fun one to pick on. And what you can do is you can go in and just uh, select an area countywide in this case, and you can then go through and look at who their largest employers are. And there's an art to this. If you're going out and you're trying to understand, you know, exactly what a business's issues are or what areas they have, not every business likes a person like an economic developer, myself or Becca, to sit down in front of them. And they're not going to pour all of their guts out and say, this is exactly what we're, we're running into. So you have to build their trust. I'd say it's 60% art, uh, 40% uh, science or technical uh, information that we bring. And so you sit down and you want to understand, you know, what are their supplier needs? What are their workforce needs? What are their expansion opportunities? And what are new markets they're trying to enter? So really get a perspective on 
uh, what is this large employer going to do? And then you work your way down. You know, you focus on the largest employers first, but then you build down into those local smaller employers. So you have a great sense of holistically, what are some things we can do to move the needle? Then let's say you're out meeting with those businesses. You hear, you know, geez, we've got 500 employees in this um, area that specialize in meat processing in the case of Cavendish Farms, for example. Well, that means you have a high location quotient of that type of skill set that gives you an opportunity to then go recruit additional businesses to further diversify that economy that might leverage those skill sets. I'm not saying you set up a program to go and compete with your largest employer, but what are some of those supportive industries that can leverage that expertise in an area? Next slide. Another example <clears throat> is um, again, really looking at location quotients. So let's say you're not out meeting with businesses, but you just want to know how do we go and dive in and figure out if we represent a high um, propensity of this particular skill set or industry or um, or not. And so you can go into the LMI data and you can search different um, uh, industries as well as uh, job types. And then you can figure out the location quotient. And essentially, the higher the location quotient, the more expertise you have in an area or the higher propensity for your area to feature that type of jobs. And it's based on a statewide and national basis. So this example is of McKenzie County, and I picked that because they have um, a high location quotient of you know, oil and natural gas. And so if you look at those industries, um, and you run this report, you're going to find out, not surprisingly, that there's a lot of oil and natural gas or oil and gas workers in that area. Well, if I'm an economic developer or I'm a county or even if I'm an HR representative and I'm trying to figure out, OK, how do we use this information? I'm going to start there and say, OK, if I'm marketing to particular people, um, I want to find supportive industries or market that um, that we can bring in new uh, business or individuals into a region. Next slide. The next is to understand sort of those opportunities and threats. So you've identified, hey, we want to set up an economic development program here. We'd like to see it successful. So then we reached out to our largest employers and we understood what we have currently. Now we need to know what are our threats out there? What are our opportunities? And I love that we talk about cost of living up here. <clears throat> and I picked that one. And so LMI has great data that you can go in and leverage and understand those opportunities and threats. And you can do that through, you know, what, what your current, um, you know, uh, employment looks like for a particular industry. And so let's say you don't have a lot of people in that industry, that could be a threat or it could be an opportunity, depends on how your organization views that. I picked on um, cost of living here because that is a funny one. We market that both ways. And what I mean by market that is when I'm out traveling across the country, meeting with businesses, I take some of our areas that we serve on the eastern side and I pull up the cost of living and I say, look, you know, we have a great cost of living. Your employees can move here. They're going to enjoy more of their income, um, comparatively speaking, to where you are across the United States. But then if the cost of living uh, gets too low, that also can play against you when you're meeting with businesses, because that's generally means there's some other uh, systemic issue that's causing that cost of living to be low. And so what happens is if you come in and you're like, hey, look, our cost of living is 60% of the national average. I've had businesses look at me and say, well, what does that mean? That doesn't interest us at all. And so you really want to be careful when you're talking about cost of living. We use it a lot. The goal here in cost of living, which could be an opportunity or a threat, is you really want to be um, close to one or the natural average. You don't want to be an outlier. You don't want to be New York City and you don't want to be way down on the bottom. If you're within 10 percent, that is a good um, a good position to be in. Just a little lower than the national average. You can use it as a marketing tool. If you're a little higher, then, you know, you you have to struggle through that. So that could be an opportunity or a threat. 
but again, a great tool in LMI to use that. Next slide. Next is talking about commuting patterns. Um, and so what you can do is you can actually look at the commuting patterns through with uh, employees that are coming to and from your businesses. And so this tool here just, just talks about uh, Cass County, and I use them as an example. And what they do is they dive in and they highlight, you know, who's driving in and working in an industry. You can also flip this and find out who's leaving your community to work in other areas, and you can tailor your program around that. Next slide. So <clears throat> finally, how do we evaluate sort of the success or failure of a program? And again, it goes back to the LMI data. And so you're gonna look at population changes, uh, economic, um, you know, the data library that that's out there again we'll pull up that and so building permits local employers long-term employment projections is another great tool to look at um, employment and wages by occupation is another one so if you're seeing those wages go up you know i know our businesses don't want to hear that but generally that's a healthy thing for the economy locally now clearly there's outliers you don't want to be on one end or another but you do want to see those opportunities increase for your constituents. And I would say that a lot of employers want to see that as well. They don't want to be paying high in wages, but they want to see opportunity and growth grow. They know instinctively that's going to help them bring in new employees. So there should be some velocity so that people can work up the career ladder. Next slide. The other thing you really need to do when you evaluate success or failure is you need to look at your particular community and what impacts um, success or failure. So again, I'm gonna pick on Grafton. So if we're an economic development agency, we're gonna go and we're gonna help that community. We really wanna know what are the top three sources of revenue impacting the city? And so that flows through to every constituent, whether you're uh, you know, uh, an employer or an employee or just a resident. And so in that particular city, you know, some of the top three revenue generators are property taxes and sales taxes, intergovernmental revenue that's tied to population and other financing sources. Grafton, for example, they have their own utility. So perhaps they're interested in large utility users to generate additional revenue or to fully utilize the infrastructure they've built out. So based on that, we're gonna then develop our plan and we're going to focus on those things that have the greatest impact on constituents. This is going to be different in every city. So if you're listening to this and you're wondering about what your city is doing, you really have to go through and, and, and look at what those budget impacts are and where the areas of opportunity are. Uh, it's going to be different for every community, township, uh, and, and county. So you have to do this work everywhere you go. So finally, LMI is a great tool to guide your economic development programs. It's very important to everybody, whether you're a, um, just a person living in a community or an area, or you're a business, or you're an HR professional trying to understand how to bring in more uh, workforce. Economic development groups are working on those issues to try and help that, and we use LMI. You can use it as well to inform your program and maybe partner with these groups to to um, you know bring greater success to whatever effort you're working on. Uh, the data provided from stakeholders um, that can identify unique uh, opportunities, and then you can check them with the uh, LMI uh, data. So. You're going to go out and you're going to meet with businesses or you're going to engage with economic development organizations and they're meeting with businesses. You can use this data to keep everybody moving in the right direction and make sure what you're hearing is backed up with the data. And then, of course, evaluate the progress along the way. One of the things we talk about in economic development is that everything changes all the time. And so conditions on the ground change. You have a um, you have a either a great success or a great failure, you need to adjust along the way. The vision generally doesn't change, but how you get there or what you're working on always changes. And I'll give a quick anecdotal example. 
you might have hey as a as an objective we really want to diversify the community or we want to bring in a large employer and so you're successful at that you bring in a large employer well now everything changes because you may have increased the the workforce in the community by you know two three hundred workers well now in order to support that business as well as the other businesses and the other constituents within that community now you're working on housing and everything else that goes along supporting your employers and so you need to continue to evaluate the progress make sure you're making adjustments as you need and you're you're delivering a successful program to your constituents with that i want to thank pat as well um, for the opportunity to be on the tape on the panel today as well as thank all of you for um, you know listening to economic development and why it impacts you thank you thank you matt uh, the information that you shared was incredible it really drives home the point that data-driven initiatives will inform stakeholders increase support and help to keep work plans on track well done thank you matt our next speaker is Matt Gardner. Matt is the eighth executive director to serve the North Dakota League of Cities. He is a member of the board of directors of the North Dakota Insurance Reserve Fund and serves on the advisory council for the Upper Great Plains Transportation Institute. As the state's municipal league director, he represents North Dakota's 355 incorporated cities. Matt lives with his wife and four children in Washburn, North Dakota. Matt is going to share some great information to include a case study that will provo uh, provide insights on some of the earlier points made by Becca and Matt Marshall. Welcome, Matt. The floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you, Pat. Um, yeah, and kudos to the previous speakers. I mean, a lot of good information. I mean, sitting here listening, I've picked up a lot as well. And I'm excited today to share just how LMI data can help our communities and our leaders in our communities uh, make some decisions. So let's get started. So you see on the screen, this is the League of Cities strategic plan and right in the middle, our vision is empower North Dakota communities. And as Pat said earlier, data is power. And that's true. I mean, for any community or business, you know, the more data and information that you have, it's going to help you make informed decisions. And that's good all the way around. And as you start looking at the puzzle pieces of our strategic plan, all of those, the foundation and the base to all that besides the needs that are in our communities, but also just the information and data that's available. And LMI can seriously help all our communities with that information. Um, let's just get started here talking about the information we have, and we'll start with, uh, actually, I'm sorry, I got off track a little bit here, but let's go to the next slide, please. So one thing that hits home is as I travel the state and I visit with community leaders is that, you know, the people are important to them. And it usually boils down to workforce. You know, they're concerned and they think about workforce for not only in their city and their city positions, but also their businesses, whether that's a main street business or a large manufacturer or whatever type of employer they have in their community. And as you look at this list, you know, recruitment and retention are top of mind, but economic development, housing, daycare, you know, the poverty level. And as Matt Marshall talked about previously, a lot of those kind of fill up into economic development and also fill up into the people we have in our communities. And so today my focus will be on workforce retention and recruitment. So the LMI data can talk about the population. And as Pat alluded to, we're gonna utilize a case study, McHenry County, to help tell a story. And as we work through this data, I want the people tuning in, especially if you have elected leaders on the webinar today is, if you had this information available to you, um, how would it impact you? How could it help you make better informed decisions and how would it impact your communities? And as we look at these tables, the lighter color on the right hand side, that is the state information and the blue column is the information for the for the county, McHenry County. So if we look at the population, how has it changed? So. It's really no surprise a rural county like McHenry County is seeing some population loss, but it's not um, super significant. I mean, we'd like to have our communities growing in North Dakota, but that does tell a story. You know, if you look at how did people get here, and I find this very unique, especially for McHenry County, you know, 70% of them are born in the state, which is probably no surprise. But if you look at the next couple, 28% come from out of the state, 
and even 1% are born outside the United States. So there's people coming into McHenry County and coming into our state um, to work here. And if you look at the comparisons, I mean, we're, McHenry County is fairly in line with um, what the state has there. Now, what's our age population? Um, you know, if you look at under the age of 25, McHenry County is a little light, um, 25 to 44, same as well. But where they really have um, some opportunity is that 45 to 64 year old age group. I mean, they're still working age. You know, they could fill a lot of positions within this county, within the communities. So that information is very helpful. And then you can see the uh, aging out population. Um, so our median age of the population in McHenry County is 42. Uh, which seems fairly young. I mean, there's just a, a lot of uh, individuals, you know, with families likely that are uh, of working age. Now, of those over the age of 25, what is their educational attainment? Um, no high school, you know, there's a little bit there, but high school diploma or equivalent, I mean, that's very high. That beats the uh, state's average. You know, some college or no degree is high again exceeds the state average associates degrees that's high as well and then it starts tapering down but that just shows that there's a an educated workforce in McHenry County to fill our jobs so this is information about the population next we'll talk about economic development so median household income uh, Matt Marshall talked about this but if we look specifically at McHenry County look at the chart in the lower right hand corner and you can see that um, our income that we generate, our median, you know, exceeds the um, what it would cost to the cost of living, which is good, and that's good for the county. And if you look at in the region, other counties in the region, um, you know, it it exceeds that as well. So McHenry County definitely has a strategic advantage in the region. Uh, if you look at the middle graph chart there, what percentage of the population lives below the poverty line, and we're you know, below the state's average, which is good. And a lot of communities out there, you know, are facing challenges with the poverty line. And if you find yourself with the data shows that you're high, you know, those are all things that you need to look into. Um, and this top chart of all childcare, 94% um, of childcare demands are met with the state's average at 81%. Um, that's definitely a strategic advantage for McHenry County. And I bet there's a lot of areas in the state that love to see that metric. Um, how has housing market changed? Um, you know, there's no house, additional housing units in McHenry County. Um, so as the workforce grows or the goal is to grow the county or grow those communities, that's definitely something that's going to have to be tackled. And next we'll talk about labor force. So unemployment rates, you know, you can look at the unemployment rates, you know, North Dakota is very you know as low compared to the rest of the country and you can see that actually in McHenry County there's a little bit higher unemployment rate than the state and you compare that with the labor participation rate and you can see again it's a little bit lower so actually there's some available workforce likely by looking at those two stats um, who makes up the labor force Seven five and a half percent are families with children under the age of 18 and both spouses are in the labor force so that's, I would say that's very high. 14.5% uh, are families with children under 18, and the husband is in the labor force, but not the wife. So again, you know, as we improve access to childcare, we might see those individuals enter the labor force. Then 8.3% 8 of families, children under the age 18, the wife is in labor force, but the husband is not. So those could be seen as opportunities and maybe challenges you know what are the reasons why some of those individuals only have one individual working um, how many open jobs are there you know it says 31 in McHenry County with over 14,000 in the state um, I think we all know that our open jobs are underreported in North Dakota so I imagine McHenry County is no different and what type of education is needed for these open jobs you know we when we think of a few slides ago where we had the information on their educational attainment, you know, it's pretty clear of the individuals in McHenry County, they're able to meet the jobs that are available. So what does this story tell us? You know, we looked through the LMI information and the point I want to make here is as we look through the LMI data and we think of what I'm talking about today and what previous speakers have spoke about today, we start telling a story. 
And not only can we compare our information from LMI, but also what do we know personally? You know, if you're a local elected leader, you're going to know your community better. If you're a local Main Street business, the same thing. So we need to start comparing and compiling the two together to help tell our story so we can attract businesses, we can attract people to our state, so we can help get or help make the right decisions to grow our communities. So here's what we know. McHenry County is in North Dakota, uh, bordered by Ward County, and Ward County has a city of Minot, so a little uh, closer access to services. So that's a strategic advantage. Um, McHenry County has 12 cities and Velva is the largest. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, Velva obviously is known as the snack food capital of North Dakota. And when we think of McHenry County, you know, what industries are out there? You know, agriculture is a big one, cattle, you know, natural resources and tourism. And so here's what the data tells us. You know, the median household income is higher than North Dakota and it's below the poverty level. So McHenry County is doing very well financially. Um, McHenry County has a higher than average age compared to the rest of North Dakota. You know, in some cases, depending on how you look at that, but there could be, you know, some um, opportunity there to recruit, you know, our old aging population to our businesses. You know, we might need flexible schedules. Um, the county can meet 94% of childcare demand. You know, there's some room for improvement, but with that being higher than the state's average, um, that's an advantage. Um, the cost of living is 1% lower than other counties in the region. 59% uh, of residents have some form of college, so that um, that's a great advantage. Um, people living in the county have a higher than average median household income. There's high labor participation rates. And this stat I found very interesting, but 94% of homeowners do not have a second mortgage or a home equity loan. So if you're a lender in that area, you know, that might perk yours up, but I'm not sure exactly what that tells us, but that is a data point to explore. And housing is more affordable than larger met metropolitan areas. So to have affordable housing, although I'm guessing the housing stock is low for growth, but it's still more affordable to help attract businesses and people to our communities. Next slide, please. So here's some more about the story. So if we focus in a little further, um, the LMI data focuses at the county level. And so you take the county data, then you start thinking about your individual communities. And here's what we know about Velva. Um, it's home to Dots Pretzels, even though the manufacturing facility has moved after they purchased from Hershey's, but that facility still exists. There's still a plant there. There's still a proven history that they can run a, um, a viable business. There's still an educated and trained workforce. They can help run a facility. Um, so it is a loss to the community, but at the same time, this brings opportunity. So when you compare the opportunity with what we know about the skilled workforce, a viable building, a viable workforce, um, you can start putting this package together. And this is what Velva looks like, but if you're McHenry County and you're any other community, there's also some benefits. Next slide, please. And so what you need to do as a community leader is just pull the LMI data together, pull around what is special and unique about your community, tell your story, and start moving forward with creating your strategic plan or executing your strategic plan. And when I travel the state, not only do I find information and um, hear what challenges are, but always before I hear about the challenges, I always hear about what's good about their community. You know, there's always that one thing that makes them unique, always something, you know, it could be a few things, but it's important for our communities to, to leverage that along with what they find out utilizing LMI data. Next slide, please. Now to have viable, and this is um, a point of personal privilege and they, other speakers have talked about this, but. You know, it's important for our communities not only to attract workforce for our business community, but also for city positions as well. I mean, we need to make sure we have highly trained, um, comparable staff in our cities to help provide the services that our cities rely on. And so LMI data can also dive into state and local government benefit information. And as you can see on the screen, and they can pull it up regionally. So if you're a city leader and uh, you need to work on recruitment and retaining your city staff, um, there's also good information available. 
So with that, Pat, this concludes my comments, but you know, excited today to talk about LMI and how um, all the, I mean, there's a number of people on this webinar today and to go back home and utilize this data. So thank you, Pat, for inviting me. Yes, thank you, Matt. Uh, great information. I think this case study shows that regardless of what the community is experiencing, this data can be used to conduct a thorough assessment to be used for effective decision making and future planning. Our final speaker today is Amy Ahrens. Amy is uh, at the Bismarck Workforce Center Manager and oversees 16 staff in administering many state and federal employment programs in Region 7. Areas of service include Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, job training, online job listings, reemployment, labor market information, and a myriad of other customer and business focused services designed to meet the current and emerging workforce needs of the state. Thanks for joining us, Amy. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Pat, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, I just want to kind of touch on something about misconceptions in our community. When you really take a look, and it's something that we all experience everywhere, and um, when you look around, you see the help wanted signs, you see uh, the shelves taking longer to be filled, you see more of like the self-checkout, maybe businesses not being open as many hours just because of that um, inability to find people to fill their open positions. Um, and so one of the kind of the big misconceptions that we see a lot kind of, of people getting asked in our office, as well as when we're out in the community, is that people have that belief that people are not working. And when we really look at North Dakota, and it's already been kind of touched on by some of the other from Matt and the Matts and Becca, is that one, we do have the lowest unemployment rate in the nation at 1.4%. We have, when you really look at that across the state of North Dakota, that means that 5,700 people are considered unemployed at this point. But when we look at those individuals as well, that also is including those that are returning to work. So they may not actually be looking for a job, but are currently not working at that time, which reduces that 5,700 even more for individuals that are looking for work. And then when we're looking at that labor force participation rate, North Dakota is typically in the highest. Uh, in October, we did drop down to second at the 69.1% for the labor force participation. But a good majority of the summer, we were the highest ranking state for participant participation rate. Then when we look at actual people filing unemployment and actually requesting um, their claims, we had um, 1,890 individuals for the week ending of the December 2nd. And of those, 64% um, were job attached, which means that 680 individuals were looking for employment. And so then when we take a look at the next um, part here on the open positions that we have across the state, with the over 13,000 open positions, um, and then when we look at the number of multiple job holders that we have, you can see that over the course of the years that North Dakota typically has always been very high in um, multiple job holders, but we have been um, declining in that, which means more open jobs. And then when we look at the new employers, just in the last um, year from 21 to 22, we saw an increase of over 1,500 um, open or new employers in our area for the state, which again means more jobs. And so when we're looking at um, the, the, the demographics of our state, and so I'm gonna look here at the next slide where we're talking about um, targeting populations. So when we're looking at the demographics of our workforce center, is that when you have misconceptions and you're not um, targeting the right populations, it can really hinder the process of hiring or recruitment. And so when we're looking at kind of one of the things that we did in our office here for our region, um, and we really looked and focused on the Burley and Morton County and really saw that um, that youth had a higher percentage than some of the other um, areas. And it was kind of consistent between both Burley and Morton. And then when we saw that typically that youth has a higher employment rate during that third quarter, we really did a push in order to push summer jobs in our schools. And so with that, we created working with the schools in um, the Bismarck and Mandan high schools to get a QR code in the schools that could push jobs that are hiring that youth population. And so all the, the, the students had to do was scan the QR code and a list of open positions in our area would populate for them. Um, and so then of course, knowing anecdotally with those, uh, those students is that they, um, with working with the schools, 
maybe we're going to maybe employers that weren't actively hiring. So that would give them that list of those that were actively hiring. And so then when we kind of look with the different employers, it's really diving in to make sure that you're being competitive in your market with your hiring and even in retention. And so um, it is something that we do commonly here where we will work with employers in order to kind of show what that common um, market looks like for your industry, which was covered on a lot of the other slides with the presenters. And so when we're looking um, at kind of what areas our office covers for services, is you can see that we are very spread out across the state. Our yellow stars are going to indicate actual physical offices, and then all the red circles are going to indicate areas that we're going out um, remote and working basically probably what once a month out in those communities. So we have people out in those communities as well. And the big thing is, is that we have that anecdotal backstory to all that labor market information. And so we see on the ground what's going on in our communities. So we know the best way to help you apply that labor market information in your community. Um, and data can really be a powerful play in your playbook. Um, so I'm really hoping that if you're not already in the game, that you're going to get in the game and find out who your Mary is. And so no matter where you are in the process of using labor market information, we have a great team across the state that can really help you use labor market information to the full potential. And we're really here and ready to let us help you with your playbook. So thank you, Pat. Thank you, Amy. Uh, workforce yeah. centers are here to help uh, and they have a direct line to the labor market information department if you need any additional reports. We are here to help you and encourage you to work with your Mary. <clears throat> At this time, uh, we're going to open up the chat, so please get your questions and feedback submitted. Obviously, we are at the end of our webinar. I apologize for the delay at the beginning, and we will be respectful of your time. So we will provide responses to any of your questions within the next few weeks. I'd like to thank our speakers and their respective organizations for their time, support, and all the great information they shared today. Well done. And a huge thank you to our behind the scenes Job Service North Dakota team, Don Gruel, our project manager, and Emily Redman, our communications officer. These webinars don't happen without them. Finally, I want to thank our sponsor, ND Sherm. Together, all have been instrumental in bringing an important message to you, our audience, and we couldn't have done this without exceptional collaboration and partnership. A great example of working as one. Again, the chat is open for you to submit your questions, and we have provided an email address as well, jsnd underscore webinar questions at nd.gov. We'd really like to hear from you on how you use the data. Please share. We want to take all of what we've learned and create a toolbox for employers so you can turn data into insights and make informed decisions. We will provide a response within the next few weeks to include a recording of this webinar to all attendees. Thank you for attending today and thank you to the ND Sherm State Council for offering recertification credits. Information on how to add credits will be sent directly from ND Sherm. That concludes our webinar. Thank you again for attending. We appreciate you.